We've got a fantastic panel here, uh, quite a broad range, um, which should give a, re a reasonably rounded picture. Um, so, um, and we're all sat in that order there, so to help you identify everyone. Um, so let me just whip along the line. So we've got um, Lindsay Krauss from um, New York Times, uh, where she is the coordinating producer um, of their short-form documentaries. Um, next to me is Naz Hack from BBC Three, where she's commissioning editor for short-form. Um, this here is Andy Mundy Castle, who's the MD of um, an indie called Doc Hearts that does a lot of short form. And at the end is um, Sam Barcroft, who lends his name to Barcroft Media, uh, which, of which he's the CEO. And um, they're all going to sort of introduce themselves properly. But actually, just before we do that, um, I just want to uh, sh see if we can quickly define what short form is. Can you help us, Lindsay? What should, what should we define it as today? Um, well, at New York Times Updocs, Closer. Um, is this fine? Yeah. Everyone can hear me? Okay. Um, at New York Times Updocs, we most of our shorts are five to ten minutes, but we go by the Academy rules, so anything under 40 minutes. Yeah, so that's the, um, for, for the Oscar short form documentary category, it's 40 minutes uh, or less. Nice. Uh, I kind of don't like getting hung up on duration. <laughs> I just say anything that's bespoke digital content. Okay, that's a good one. How would you uh, say, Andy? Short form is anything shareable, likable. Um, social and under 40 minutes as per the Academy rules. Good, okay. And Sam, anything to add? You've got the raw end of the deal here. Not really. I suppose it's anything I like as long as it's serving its purpose at the time. So uh, I think the best thing about uh, the idea of short form is it's not long form. Okay. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Well, that, that, will, um, you know, that gives you various sort of angles into, um, into that question. Um, so fundamentally, uh, from uh, anything from 40 minutes of uh, Academy um, entry to 6.5 seconds of a vine and everything in between, um, but not just about duration. Um, so we'll work our way down the table from here, but everyone's just going to introduce themselves and just show you a little clip so that you can get a feel for their um, output. So we'll start with Lindsay. Um, sure. So New York Times Opdocs was founded in 2011 by the opinion department, so not by the newsroom. Um, it was in our editorial section, and it was made as a platform for independent filmmakers, both emerging and established, to contribute their points of view on... Um, some of the most important issues of our time. So they can be about anything. Um, we're just looking for beautiful, creative, important films that will start a discussion among our audience. And as I said, they're often about 5 to 15 minutes, but they can be up to 40 minutes. Um, we're just looking for, again, films that start, um, spark a conversation among our audience, ideally have an impact, whether that's on policy or just changing people's minds. Um, but we can show the, the trailer and... See from there. Okay, we have Lindsay's trailer, please. Uh. <laughs> Hang on, I think we'll um. Not me. Okay. <laughs> we'll just get Technical this sorted <laughs> and um, just just while. We'll, do you need a couple of seconds there? Okay, good. Um, I mean, one thing, just before we um, come back to that, just it's worth saying that it's been quite a big year um, in short form this year. Um, some, some important things have shifted. Um, amongst them are that there are short form players that have direct relationships with their audience. There's also short form players that are doing um, co-production deals with international distributors, Sam being one of them, so he could talk a little about that. <laughs> There are um, indies that are commissioning um, their own original content. And, of course, all the time, the broadcasters continue to commission um, short form. The large media organizations and newspapers continue to commission it, and so do um, a number of brands. So things have made quite some progress this year, and um, new um, paradigms are, are emerging. Um, how are we doing on the video front? We good to go. Let's go. Um, so we move on to um, Naz, who um, operates out of BBC Three. 
Yeah, so short form is a massive uh, part of the BBC3 offer, given that we're online. Um, we work across uh, YouTube, iPlayer, Facebook, Instagram, and I look after, basically it's a cross-genre, I don't like to think in genre, but essentially you can commission anything that ranges from entertainment, comedy, factual, fact and ish or what is known as fact and and documentary, really. And, it, and for us, it's really important because it's a pathfinder for young people to the rest of the BBC, and it's about nurturing new talent. So um, it's a massive part of, of the BBC3 offer. Lovely. If we can see Naz's um, clip. <laughs> Lovely. Um, so, Andy um, from uh, Doc Hearts. Hello, everyone. Um, so, I set up Doc Hearts in 2016. Um, Documentary is at our heart. Everything we do is factual. Um, and uh, I suppose what, what we aim to, to, to kind of focus on is character led films and access access-driven pieces. Um, we work for brands, institutions, and broadcasters. Short form uh, kind of keeps the company going, really. It's the, it's the lifeblood of the company. So long-form commissions are kind of fewer and harder to come by when you're a new indie. So we do exist um, quite largely on the short-form work that we, we, we get. You know, that keeps us, keeps us paid and keeps the lights on. So here's a clip. Last but not least, Sam. Oh, um, so, uh, yeah, short forms, well, what they said, basically. <laughs> um, I kind of think it's really nice to be here and to hear all these uh, amazing things about what's happening in short form, just saying. You know, it's uh, some amazing content and some massive steps forward over the last few years um, in, in this space, I would say. Um, so what do we do? We make lots of original documentaries. I think I've commissioned about 2,000 over the last four years, mostly internal, some partnerships. And we're kind of on a mission as a company to inspire the world through amazing true stories. And we do that in lots of different ways. But we do uh, make a lot of short form, and that is the kind of the key wheel and which creative wheel that um, everything else plays out of. So um, if we can tell an amazing story in five minutes that inspires and moves people, then we know that's likely to have a lot of impact in the world, but it's also likely to be successful in other places and in other ways. So we've created a multi-revenue stream, multi-outcome editorial system, which kind of starts often um, with short form. Interestingly, broadcasters often do it the other way around and start with long form and end up with some short form. Yeah. I'm kind of on a mission to turn the curve upside down and start with short form. And, and I think a lot of people here are already on that um, vibe. But I think super exciting time to be playing in this space because actually we're kicking out all the old bullshit and starting it all fresh. And, um, and so it feels really exciting. So, um, yeah, here's a little tape. So, Sam, can we just pick up from that, and can you explain um, how the economics of short form works within the context of Barcroft? Yes. Um, actually, I'll I try and do it. Sorry, yeah, can I, sure. Actually, that's the second question I wanted to ask you. The first yeah. one, I just think some people might not be aware. Could you give people a sense of the scale of um, short form uh, through Barcroft? Sure. Um, well... So the scale in terms of reach is um, building all the time. So on YouTube, last month was our most successful month. So we got 131 million views on our main channel last month. So that puts us about number 12 in the UK of all the channels on YouTube and um, in the top kind of 300 in the world. And so there's a lot of reach on YouTube. We kind of did about 200 million on Facebook last month on Facebook Watch. So we've launched 13 series on Facebook Watch now. And so we're reaching a lot of people via those platforms and Weibo in China, lots of other places like MSN and Yahoo. So we've grown this distribution network, which is really good. And what we power that with is our original content, plus some content from distributors. Because interestingly, TV companies want to get a bit of the advertising revenue that we can find online. Yeah. Um, and uh, so the model works in a way that we essentially fund our own uh, content and then we find lots of different ways of making little bits of money out of it mm -hmm. and so the reason you saw the Netflix sign on there and the BBC and the Channel 4 sign is we use the originals we make each week which is only five films mm -hmm. so it's not like 
105 films. I think uh, people like BBC Three and New York Times will do significantly more amount of content than that sometimes. Um, but what we've worked out is that if we make content that feels universal and interesting to broader audiences, that we reach a lot more people. And so we have a team who come up with ideas every week. Um, we make as many of them as we can afford to make, and then we slowly turn them into series. And if we think they're really good, we pitch them into long form, as Andy was saying. And if we think they're really good, they um, then turn into series brands, which we then make into TV shows. So we've created a kind of a circular economy, which um, means that we've got our own sandpit at work that we can jump in and um, where we can tell stories that we think are important. And yes, if you go out there and try and produce five professional documentaries a week on YouTube revenue only, you're going to be broke. Um, but I think if you then find out other ways to take advantage of that. So, for example, um, we did a, fil a few films about people that have amazing living spaces, and then we reimagined that as a teaser for a show about amazing interiors for Netflix, which is now a 12-part Netflix original series. So it shows that um, we're basically funding our cross-funding our development by um, using YouTube as the starting point. And I think that that's a really key thought. And it also enables you to take many more creative risks because no one gives a fuck if you put something up on YouTube and it's rubbish, you know, but they really do on BBC One at 9 o'clock, you know. So um, basically it means you can take many more creative risks, use it as a nursery slope, right. but also engage loads of people that don't really give a monkeys about what's on telly and don't really find television very easily um, and so it's really nice after well, I started that channel in 2008 so we're 10 years into that channel so um, it's really lovely to see other people surpassing what we do augmenting what we do you know doing their own thing in this space and particularly around tv and publishing uh, because Honestly, most of it's been crap up until about five years ago, and then for, it's been little diamonds in the rough. But now, I think, as we can see from the range of this panel, not just this panel, lots of other people, it's kind of a force building. It feels like there's a positive movement in the force. I'm going to get my Ewok outfit on <laughs> uh, and get involved. Cool. Um, Lynn, uh, can, can you just tell us a, um, a bit about, um, uh, Lindsay, about... Um, at what stage you tend to engage with filmmakers and what kind of filmmakers you're dealing with? Sure. Um, so we love to work with filmmakers from all around the world. I always say that we're looking for local takes on universal topics. So one thing we're not looking for necessarily is, um, I mean, this could potentially work too, but, you know, an American going to India and telling us about what's going on and, like, on the ground with the Hindu nationalist movement in India, for example. Um, or even an American going to England and letting us know about um, Brexit. Uh, we're looking for a, an English person to tell us about that. Um, we're looking for an Indian person to tell us about what's going on in India. Um, but and to that end, we are looking for um, people on the ground in the places that they are making films about to um, make universal stories. So perhaps a love story in Australia that someone in Argentina can watch, or someone or one of our viewers in Japan can watch, and you know feel something the same way that someone who is close to that story will will feel something. Um, we're looking for filmmakers at all different stages of their careers. Uh, we've worked with Oscar winners, you know, everyone from Errol Morris, Laura Poitras, to um, to one of our um, uh, most frequent contributors right now is a junior in college, I believe. So, um, and he's made really, really terrific films for us. So there is no barrier to um, who can contribute. We're looking for the most surprising creative films that we can possibly get our hands on. What was the other part of your question? No, that was well, what. what at what stage in the process oh. do you engage with them? Yeah, and so we love to hear about projects as early in the process as possible, but the stage that we can really give you um, feedback as to whether or not it will probably work for us is when we see a rough cut state, when we see a rough cut or some sort of representative footage where we get a sense of your filmmaking style and the characters that you're portraying, because we really do like character-driven uh, character films. Uh, so when we get a sense of what we're actually going to see on the film, that's when we can kind of give you a sense of, no, maybe this isn't quite right for us, um, try again, or um, absolutely, this is a great character, this is a great story, um, we'd love to see more. And then from there, we send you a contract, we talk about a fee, we pay after publication, and we would go through a number of rounds of production notes, uh, again, depending on the shape that 
of the cut that you sent us initially, depending on what shape that's in. So I would say that process between rough cut and publication in an ideal sense um, would take about eight weeks or so, um, but it can take anywhere from a week, which I don't love when that happens. Um, that's usually when it's kind of around some sort of news hook uh, that it needs to go pretty soon. Uh, so anywhere from about a week to it can take uh, two years. We don't have we don't have deadlines, so we're not going to pressure you to um, to finish something on a timeline that doesn't work for you. Okay. Um, how does the process look from your perspective? Oh, uh, I mean, you know, it's kind of I suppose the traditional thing of independent companies sending me uh, paper pitches or coming in for a chat. Um, but, you know, I like to mix it up a bit. I don't want to be kind of, you know, driven by the kind of infrastructure of uh, commissioning that people know from broadcasters. Um, so I always say to people, come in, have a chat, you know, some, what excites you. Maybe there's something that I've seen that I kind of think, oh, it's kind of in the space that you're talking about, so how about I think about this? Um, we have individuals who contact me as well as companies. I, I think it's good for, like, brand new individuals to kind of uh, partner up with a company that's kind of good at nurturing somebody. Uh, so they might have an exec, perhaps, that kind of um, helps them through the edit process. But, I mean, it's fairly organic. It's kind of like there's no, you know, set process, like, now we're going to do this, then we're going to do this stage, then we're going to do this stage. And as Damien, our controller, always says, you know, no one's sitting around waiting for our shit. You know, it's like we have a non-linear structure. That's the purpose of digital. So, you know when something's right or it feels right, you know, we're going to basically publish it or put it out there. Um, but it is, it's a very open uh, kind of uh, way of working. You can email direct. You can uh, email me as an individual, or I'd prefer it if you came in with somebody who might be able to help you. How's your idea? Um, but, yeah. And um, how do you measure the success of what you're doing now? Because I think that's changed over time a bit. Yeah, I mean, look, there are various metrics, but ultimately we're a public service, you know, part of a public service broadcast. You know, we want to make content that has an impact that, you know, speaks to modern Britain and speaks to young people because we have a very specific demographic. So, you know, you can measure it by a success, by numbers on the various platforms that we work on, or you can measure it by a kind of, you know, awards and kind of kudos and, you know, talkability factor, or you can just measure it by the fact that people are liking and sharing and clicking and talking. Uh, so, I mean, there are various ways of measuring, I guess. And uh, you know. do any of those take primacy? In, 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 in no, I mean, you kind of know what something, when something's good. You know, for yeah. us, it was, a, it was, you know, it meant a lot that we were nominated in three out of, for three out of the four kind of BAFTA short form kind of, uh, you know, in the new category that they have, we, were three, we had three out of four nominations. So that, that you know, that, that's lovely. It's great. That's a big, you know, it's a step anyway broadly in the right direction for short form in the wider industry. But, you know, we're not sitting around there, like, you know, ticking and, you know, yeah. kind of going, yes, yes, we've hit that target right now because we are a public service broadcaster. We need to make content that says something about Britain and says something about our audience. Sure. I mean, I was thinking more about the um, social dimension. I mean, Sam... Um, um, what do you kind of look for in terms of um, try, you know, ways of measuring the impact of what you're doing, and in particular in terms of engagement? Well, what role does that play? That's a good question. Um, I'm addicted to the studio app on my iPhone. I don't know if anybody else has got that. It's kind of a thing of dread and fear and also massive cocaine-style joy when the numbers <laughs> have gone the right way. So um, if you're on YouTube, I'd download it. It's better than Candy Crush. Um, <laughs> But I would say, yeah, so there's a lot of numbers and scratching of heads. Uh, our engagement is really high on Facebook, so it's really interesting and that they feed back to us that they're more bothered about engagement than they are about reach or views. So if someone likes or shares or comments on something, for them, that's much more important. But are, really you, that, are you buying that? or I mean, you just said it in a way like you might not be buying it. Well, I think what you have to remember is, as a producer, you're always usually making something for somebody else's platform. Mm. And most of us here are doing that every day. And so if you're making something other than Lindsay, we're all really making somebody else happy by doing what we do. So um, if I make something with Naz, if Naz is happy, I've done my job. You know, and hopefully she's happy because our audience is happy and she knows our audience better than I do. So essentially... Um, I think when you look at Facebook or YouTube, you have to think, what, what, how are they setting up their communications to you? Well, really, they want dwell time. So they're very focused on how long you stay within YouTube or how long you stay within Facebook. I don't really care. As long as you're on a site that's serving ads, um, yeah. then they're happy. Um, and so that's how fake news happened. That's, is, it's, that's their overriding 
um, kind of ambition is just to keep you in. Obviously, they've got missions and morals and everything else, but from a business case, they just want you to stay there and they want you to see adverts. And so um, I think that my view is it's great when people care about a film you make and that's what makes me happy in the world. And that can be for good reasons or bad reasons. But um, I think that when we see something that has a lot of engagement, that makes me pleased. And I feel that a bit like Naz it's really difficult to know what a success is in short form. You know, mm. you don't win Oscars necessarily. You don't, um, you don't have the whole world talking about it in the way they once did around television and news. You know, it's become much more difficult to know what's a hit and what isn't uh, mm. because it, the world is so much more diluted mm. and massive than it used to be. So I think it's gut feel these days and, and interaction as a combination. Yeah. So that's a crap answer. No, I don't know, basically, <laughs> is the answer. Um, Andy, when you were sort of uh, saying your definition, you, you were talking about the sort of social dimension of short form. Do mm. you want to say a bit more about your experience of that? In terms of? Um, just in terms of um, the fact that um, it's not just about linear viewing of content and also I suppose the fact that you don't make a piece of short form video mm. without some sort of social strategy around it. Yeah, well, I mean, I think you, you just have to look at that, that holy grail, that audience that, has, that TV has, I suppose, from, from my, my background, is kind of, they've, they've forgotten there's that 16 to 35 age group that is, you know, that we do want to get, get the attention of. And they're constantly like that. It's just swipe, swipe, and they're, they're feeding on that, that, that phone. And you, I think TV kind of lost that audience and I've, in, in many ways. And I feel that... Um, the, the ability to just do something powerful in a short space of time for them to be able to share with their communities or with, with whoever they're, they're speaking to is, has, a, has a very powerful, powerful impact. You know? mm. yeah. um, Sam, I, I just want to go back to what you were talking about before in terms of leveraging short form to make other stuff and mm -hmm. longer form. Uh, how do you approach that? So, you know, when you walk into Netflix, what do you walk in with and... Well, cap in hand usually, yeah. desperate, <laughs> desperate for a big, massive... That's interesting, some of the people... I've had that said to me. Uh, it's an interesting point, that. Mm -hmm. I've had that said to me by some people in the fangs, which is they, they have these producers that come in cap in hand, as a phrase. Yeah. You know, because I think the business model that we all use in television, where, especially at PSBs, you walk in, you come up with an idea. Sometimes they come up with the idea. Then they give you all the money up front to make it. You get to keep a load of that money. And then they hand you all the rights. And you get to sell it all around the world, right? That's kind of like a jackpot, lottery, <laughs> hot tub, cigars <laughs> kind of yeah, yeah. moment, right? Which is over, by the way. Yeah. And if it's not over already, you're, you've been doing this a long time. And you're in the, the old boys club and doing very well out of it. Mm. But if you're not in it yet, you'll never be in it. And um, you have to realise that um, it's changed, you know, things have changed. So I feel like um, uh, when I go into Netflix, what I like to do is be able to show them a piece of content that I've proven the data on. So I can say that this has caused interest because of that, or I can show that this group of films on our channel, people strongly react to that subject area or that area um, in a positive way or a negative way, it just helps with the cell. Because yeah. I'm going in with my double glazing, yeah. you know, under one arm, and my watch is in there, <laughs> and I'm going in desperate to let them, um, to help let them support me to do what I love to do, which is tell stories. So yeah. um, having data to be able to say, look, guys, we made this, and loads of people liked it, and it was really interesting, and it had all these qualitative and quantitative kind of feedbacks... It's a bit of a blag, really, but if it gets me to where I want to be, then it's really useful. But so you, do you, you don't get kind of not invented here syndrome or you've already done it, it's been done now? Yes, but not from Netflix. So I yeah. think Netflix are very, in my experience, pragmatic and data-driven and outcomes-focused. Yeah. I think definitely in other places you get that feeling that if uh, that people want to take creative ownership of the project that you're working with them on and i love that there's nothing better than walking into a meeting and saying i'd love to make a film about castles and they go have you seen this thing on greyhounds i go yeah love greyhounds let's do greyhounds you know like let's be honest if somebody's going to hand you that work you're going to be able to pay the mortgage you're doing greyhounds all day long you know so i think that um you've got to, you know it's true isn't it so i think that um from that perspective 
I like both ways of doing things. So I like going in with something that's already a thing that we're proud of and being honest and trying to get people to embrace that. But I'm also really happy to go in and have a conversation that's genuinely open-minded, where people can essentially show me what they need. Because if I'm making something for them, I'm making something for them, not for me. You know, so so I've got to kind of get my head around what they want. So... um, uh, Netflix are an incredible once in a generation phenomenon I believe and, um, a bu- and a very interesting bunch of folks but um, kind of others are very different from them I would say okay. um, Naz can you tell us a bit about how you work across different platforms yeah well we have um, well I suppose when at commission stage we talk about potentially the platform that a piece of content might sit on so when we've worked with Farcroft on an acquisition commission or acquisition as you call it acquisition yeah <laughs> baby yeah. Um, <laughs> so you know at that stage we kind of knew that you know it, they're YouTube pieces yeah. that could then be cut down for Facebook so um, we have conversation up front but you know things can change it's the world of you know digital content um, and yeah essentially we also uh, the channel so by the way I must say short form spans my slate which is the independent slate so I look after commissions from independent producers as well as an in-house team we've got a brilliant in-house team that sits across london and birmingham um and also we have some um short form coming out of some of the genres as well like current affairs so um, i'm just today representing the whole gamut of the short form not just my slate um so yeah uh, we also have a channel team so we've got um execs who sit on you who sit and work across you know kind of public publishing content to youtube facebook instagram uh, and I play it, and so we work with them to try and kind of, you know, figure out the best way to sort of hone and shape a piece of content for that platform. So some of it happens up front, some of it happens as the edit kind of uh, proceeds, and then some of it happens at the point of delivery, if you like. So, um, and how, how, do, how do the BBC um, frame all that kind of activity in terms of not being um, too hung up about everything being on owned and operated channels? Um, I mean, like, I can't speak for the BBC. I can only speak for three, I have yeah. to say. I mean, we are what we are. You know, we have our own kind of, you know, strategy, if you like, and that comes partly from our controller and partly from conversations that we have with the people who help manage our different platforms. I mean, you know, there are conversations around, you know, how much you put on, you know, kind of, kind of, you know, Facebook versus iPlayer, if you like. But, mm. I mean, for, for me as a commissioner, it's really important that a piece of content kind of um, fits that platform and can be discovered by our audience. That's the most, like, that's the ultimate thing and that it absolutely has a purpose and a sense of you know a sense of worthwhile kind of purpose if you like for our audience that's all I care about and then I work with whoever is the specialist on that platform to get that you know content bespoke for it so um so you uh, is the content always um specific for the platform you don't put the same um, thing into onto different platforms it depends on the content so for instance you know we did uh, just an example might be Ramesh talking to comedians we've got a short form series that we do and so for iPlayer we do kind of it's a slightly longer 30 minute stitch of the various shorts that exist on Facebook mm. and um, YouTube so you know it depends on the content that's why short form is such a nebulous thing because you know we don't sit there kind of you know up front going yes it's going to be 25.5 you know second minutes long and it's going to be on this platform it's going to take eight, eight weeks to get it you know mm. we're very much kind of like let's see how it goes according yeah. to the editorial and that's the beauty of short form content so. okay lovely um, Lindsay do you tend to you're, you're pretty much operating entirely off of your own platform off of off the, um, do you ever do you ever feel uh, bursting with a desire to sort of um, break out into the wider online world, or does it work fine for you in that way? Yeah, I mean it's a bigger negotiation. I imagine at some point you'll see OpDocs, like a package of OpDocs, on some other platform um, as a way to reach new audiences. But we do have the advantage, just being the New York Times. Um, all OpDocs are um, premiere on the New York Times homepage, uh, just kind of up at the top right, um, up against the most important breaking news. And so they do get quite a lot of views, not only from, I think we have like, some, don't, don't quote me on this, but something like 2.83 million subscribers, like digital subscribers. And then um, obviously, and all, all videos are available for free on our site. So they're already reaching a pretty vast group of people um, uh, that's pretty international as well so we're we're satisfied with um, having everything on the New York Times and they live on our site forever too so and we're constantly kind of re-upping them re-promoting them in different collections as we get more films so um, we're, we're certainly 
um, happy with the amount of reach that we're offering filmmakers just by virtue of being on our site. That being said, we have had we have posted many films to Facebook and Facebook Watch. Experimented with native uploads. Um, of course, we're always putting them on our on the Times uh, social channels as well. Um, and then we have a pretty robust YouTube strategy ourselves just for reaching a different audience than the sort of obvious Times audience as well. Great, okay. Um, Andy, can you just tell us a bit more um, about how short form fits into the mix of your business and the role it plays in your sort of business model? So at the moment, it's, it's probably it's 80% of the business. Um, so we, typically, we work with agencies who, are, who, who will have clients and uh, we're, we're, we're pitching ideas through them to uh, predominantly for branded content mm. or because yeah, we're a small team we, um, I've got someone who we employ on a business development front and look, look towards institutions to kind of give them ideas about how they can use factual short form to communicate stories that may be pertinent to, to, the, to the areas that we are special, specialists in which is predominantly diversity, inclusivity and equality so we kind of, we look at things that they've got out there on content that they may have or on platforms they have already but um, what can we bring to the table and I think that um, you know there's a series that we're doing with Coventry University at the moment which is looking at you know diversity being a dirty word and um, that's kind of across looking at right across the spectrum throughout the university um, telling stories of students who've who've got different experiences and you know it kind of um, it's a large 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 part of our business It's it's a very large part of our business. Um, and have you had any experiences of um, evolving short form into other things yet? Other than with you, no, because I think well, but I, the relationship I've got with Adam, I suppose he, he looked. There was an idea that I brought into Channel Four when he was previously there, the Black Lesbian Handbook, and that I suppose has evolved the relationships that, that we've had. That mm. kind of took that when you when when real stories were set up through Little Dot Studios, you know, I suppose that. It's more about that broader sort of um, that relationship that's been created, yeah. created really. So short form to long form, I haven't, yeah, been fort- I haven't been fortunate enough to have that yet. Have you had a go yet? Um, or not really had the time? In? No, no, but we're working on it. We've pitched a few ideas from the short form things that we've had, but um, I think it's the, the, the crossover is still, still yet to prove fruitful for us. Right, okay, cool. Um, Sam, how, how international is your business now? Well, um, in terms of our people, we've got um, an office in Hackney and another one in uh, New Delhi in India and another one in Brooklyn in New York. And so, um, so we're kind of internationally focused in terms of our teams. And then uh, most of our money comes from American clients in terms of work, producing content for others. Um, and, uh, you know, so therefore, and one of our biggest shows is a Discovery International show. So that's a genuinely global show that plays in a lot of different countries. So um, in terms of UK, you know, uh, BBC Three and what we do with them and some work for four and five is a part of what we do, but it's certainly dwarfed by our global income. And I'd say most of our viewers on social come from, well, 40% roughly come from the US. And so our social viewership is kind of 10%. Uh, UK. So right. 90% of our social viewership comes from outside the UK and m- probably a significant proportion of our overall income comes from global. Um, and I think that's a real interesting point, Adam. You're very good at mm. questions that have a lead <laughs> on, so sorry. Um, <laughs> but I think it's a really interesting thing that we're playing on a language-based economy here, not a nation-based economy. So yeah. essentially if you're if you make films in English, you're playing to people that understand and are interested in English language content globally. Um, if you're playing in uh, Mandarin, you're doing better because you've got more people that speak Mandarin than English. But um, essentially, uh, you need to leverage the global income of short form in a way that you don't necessarily... Uh, there's a much uh, richer economy around long-form television distribution which is very nation and window focused and and so we try very hard to lean into the English language economy rather than just the British media economy um, which make and I think that other companies are doing the same thing as you see from our tape there's a lot of American voices on there Um, but but that's because uh, 
I think most of our audience is there. And I think that the other thing in kind of new form content is you need to show your audience on screen. Yeah. You know, you need to talk to them in their language about things they care about, because otherwise uh, you're letting yourself down on the potential of what you can do. And I think that all the companies on this uh, stage have done that really well. And I think the more you do that, the more outcomes you get. And one of the big tricks for us is reduce the number of misses after a while because yeah. you can make mistakes and mistakes are very helpful but when you actually get a rich vein of form you get exponential results in digital so if you can get those things at work a bit like tv you they're, they're much more powerful than things that don't work unfortunately yeah. so you need to kind of double down on those and so um what role does um data play actually editorially with what you do um well I, th I don't. I think it's always got to be a mix of data and editorial intuition. So that that kind of put your finger in the air, work out whether it's a shit idea or a good idea. You know, based upon what you know from uh, what you care about and what people around you care about, as well as just does it rate out of the box, because it's really important to try and have a balance of the two. And I think that's why um, people that go after fads on social it's really a massive boom and bust generally because they get ironed out by the platforms anyway. So essentially what we did, we had a Facebook crisis a couple of years ago when we'd been steadily growing our Facebook followers and then all of a sudden it just went into this kind of dead zone of it didn't matter what we did on Facebook, it was just like the, this horrible kind of singleton view of the world of no one loves me, no one cares. <laughs> and then um, all of a sudden, a year ago, it's been transformed by Watch and now we, we stuck with putting up five to ten minute long documentaries when everyone just wanted memes of people falling down the stairs and Donald Trump. And basically um, and it played out for us in the end because now all of a sudden Facebook are desperate for uh, authentic, uh, well-made content. And so all of a sudden we've got, well, 10x the number of subscribers we had at the end of last year. So, so it does, you, if, you, if you stick to high-quality content that you really believe people are going to want to engage with, generally all those movements end up in a good place for you, I think. And can you just tell people a bit about Facebook Watch? Because not everyone's going to be familiar with that. Here. Sure. So Facebook Watch is uh, a platform that Facebook have delivered uh, that launched in the US last August, I want to say. Is that right? And essentially, it's their version of all four. So it's an advertising-powered um, uh, video hub that sits in the Facebook app on your mobile. And I think there are other ways of accessing it as well. It doesn't look that different to Facebook, but the point of it is to bring a lot of TVS content into the Facebook environment so that Facebook can take more data and make more money out of advertising. Yeah. And... Um, you, there are a few ways to access it, but essentially you either are commissioned to make original content by the team in LA who, who commission um, original content, which is very generous commissions in a TBS way, but with a focus on uh, the interactive elements of the content, which gets me super excited. Um, <laughs> Or it's a partnership, so you um, come to an agreement with them to share content you already own. Um, and we're doing that, and... It's really exciting because they really are stepping towards Oculus in the way that they view their content, which I think is much more exciting than just doing other 2D stuff. So mm -hmm. 2D is amazing, it's what I do, but I think the idea that Facebook want you to aggressively lean into polling, into live, into 360, into um, interactive building of communities, mm -hmm. for me, is like one path on my great kind of ambition to be in that ready player one hamster ball you know so i kind of think that there's a there's a really interesting next level shift up um which i think i'm desperate to be a part of just on a personal level because i think it'll be wonderful i think it'll be terrible because some of it will just suck it'll be made by geeks for geeks and it won't really work in the same way as telly does but i think if we can get there slowly and the great thing about facebook really is only thing that Watch gives you at the moment is a little bit of ad revenue plus um, more subscribers. Really, if you want to, anyone in this room can go live around the world right now um, and speak to as many people as care. None of us could do that five years ago. You know, um, humanity's never been able to do that until very, very recently. So it's massively empowering. So if you want to tell stories, there's no excuses, guys. <laughs> you can reach as many people as, as care immediately. So mm. that's kind of scary and good at the same time but I'd urge everybody to lean into that opportunity because I think it's very empowering and um, you don't need money you just need an internet connection and a phone so I mean that's a very kind of positive um, 
perspective on the future. I'm going to ask uh, the other three uh, what they see as the sort of direction of travel for short form, and then I'm going to open um, up to questions from the floor. So just to sort of finish that thinking, what do you see as the sort of um, direction of travel for short form going forwards? Um, I see sh short form as something that it's, it's only going to grow, it's only going to get better and more people are going to become you know kind of just versed with with that language of, of what it is and I think that the new generation of content creators are that that's that's their digital that's their native language that is what they understand and I feel that you know as as people consume it more more people become become aware of it I think it's only positive it's going to you know it's going to keep on growing and more brands institutions broadcasters are going to find ways to tap into that because mm -hmm. you know it's um Join, join the wave or, or sink. Right. Um, how about you, Ines? What do you think the sort of general direction of travel is? I think similar to what the guys were saying, I think there's just a myriad of ways of working. You know, it's interesting that Vox now partnering up with Netflix, you know, for 20 minutes, that's interesting. You know, very soon they'll probably have a tab that says short form and, you know, you click on there and you can watch as much short form as you want. So it's going to get, you know, slightly incestuous. You know, we work with Vox, you know, who else are we going to mm. work with, you know? Mm. So it, for me, it kind of means that things have just got to speak louder and be slightly more innovative and I want to see pictures that absolutely blow my mind you know it's going to be harder to get attention essentially uh, and for us that's like for everybody I guess uh, on the panel you know that's that's the key isn't it we want 16 to 34 year olds to sit and watch and spend time with us so it just means things are going to get harder in some ways but also exciting because you know it means we're hungry for brilliant ideas and brilliant people so and um, have you got any kind of um tips or clues for people um, as to how to make stuff that does attract attention and retain attention? No. No? <laughs> no I, I mean, you kind of know when something's good. I suppose I always say to people, please watch what we're doing, watch what, your, what our competitors are doing. You know, it's kind of slightly disheartening when I, you know, open up an email and it's like another pitch about dating in a taxi. I mean, and I also think it's about timing as well. So pitch me stuff that could only be pitched now on these platforms, you know, don't pitch me stuff that could be, I'm sorry, this is really harsh and I don't want to no, call no, us hard, but you know, don't pitch me stuff that could have been pitched to a television commissioner as an extra bit of content 10 years ago on ITV. I mean, you know, yeah. I just say to people, come on guys, you're watching this stuff, you know better than I do, you know. Yeah. Um, so I always say to people, you know, I, I urge people to have a look at what's out there and if it yeah. excites you, then it surely will excite me, but if it doesn't excite you, don't just come to me because you want some dosh. Lovely. Um, how about you? What do you think about um, where things are going in the immediate future? Yeah, I mean, I think um, with shorts, the opportunities are only growing. Um, shorts are a lot harder to make in some ways than features, I think, because you're trying to get to the same point and get the same reaction from a viewer, but in a much shorter, more condensed, and generally more linear format. You know, you can't have a chorus of people saying the same thing. Generally, you've got to have one person, one through storyline, um, getting at that thesis. And I think um, when when filmmakers are able to accomplish that, it can arguably be more powerful because there's not the distractions um, that you have time to put into a feature. You know, the, the cinematographic flair um, flourishes that can go in a feature. Um, with a short, you need to get to the point, um, often just through one really powerful character or story. Um, and that's really hard to do. Um, but when it, when it works, it's powerful. And I think the opportunities are only going to grow. I mean, I mean, this panel, the things that we would be saying about shorts would be totally different even three years ago. Uh, and, I mean, I, th I think just the number, when Opdocs was started in 2011, I don't think there was any um, online sort of news platform doing this kind of thing, like short documentaries available online, and now there's quite a few, in addition to these amazing production studios and other uh, other distributors. So it's definitely growing. And then as, as you look at just the way that people are consuming content, first of all, there's so much content that shorts are are just easier to consume um, just from a from a limited time perspective from a limited uh amount of time that people have to actually watch things and attention spans, but also as we get into things like self-driving cars, what are people going to do during that time? Social media, yes, you know, email, yes, but also watching short short films, like short um, short entertainment, and so the the um, time and venues for watching for consuming this content is only going to get bigger. Lovely. Uh, very quick question for you, Sam. Um, how long do you reckon you've got um, to um, uh, engage people's attention at the beginning of a short film? Well, if you don't get the headline and the uh, photo right, then you haven't got any time because you missed them already. Yeah. So um, good point. I think uh, that's the most important thing to not get wrong. 
um, okay. and I'd put more time into your headline and your photos. A bit like my daughter, who's 15, does when she's captioning her Insta pictures. Oh my God! Mm. Hour and a half later, she's still wondering which emoji to put on it. You know, but <laughs> it does matter, right? And it matters because it's it, that, that's the most important thing for discovery. I think yeah. probably longer than you think now. It, yeah. because the feed-based system is falling away and a more kind of selective TV. If you look at the YouTube platform versus how it used to be, yeah. it's slower, it's more considered. So, yeah. so I might be wrong. I think if you get people through the headline and the thing now, our dwell rates are pretty, are pretty positive now. I think on Facebook they're still much shorter than they are on uh, YouTube, but yeah. that may be because we have a lot of hour-long films on our YouTube channel, which kind of bucks the trend. But... I think if you've got somebody in past a minute, then you're going to get quite a long watch out of them, if you can get them through the first minute, really. Yeah. Okay. That's, yeah, and that's quite generous, I think. But, <laughs> but you'll put, you put a lot of stress on the, on the, on the title and the, um, and the thumbnail. Yeah. In other words, the first, first part of the mission, which is to get someone to click in the first place. Because yeah. you've got nothing else if you don't get past yeah. there. Yeah. Okay, lovely. Well, look, we, um, let's have a few questions from, from you out there, whatever... Um, is on your mind. There's some microphones knocking around. There's a question over here in the front and one in the back, so I'm not sure where the mic is. Why don't you start with the lady in the second from back row? Um, thanks very much. Um, given the importance of online um, viewing and, and mobile, um, are you doing vertical videos? Sam, do you do vertical videos? Uh, yes, but not publicly, so no. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, I think, I think there's a new... So, so we basically go on audience demand. Obviously, Snap's massive. Not if you're my age, because you don't know how to use your phone. When Snapcat comes on, it's like a panic attack moment. <laughs> but, um, but I think if you're under, like, 30, probably Snapchat's very important. But also Instagram, vertical videos coming out now as a professional kind of uh, video hub. So I think... Basically, two means that we've got no choice. So if it was only one, we could kind of pretend it wasn't happening. But now Instagram are launching vertical video. I think we have no choice but to do it, which is a massive pain. Do you use square format as well? Not, not really. We kind of belligerently carry on doing things how we think they need to be done uh, because it co costs money. Every single part of this process costs money. So if you have to convert something to upright, someone's got to sit there for a day or maybe even longer making an editorial decisions about how to frame stuff. It's, it's expensive. Have you shot stuff for, for vertical? No. I mean, as, as a new company, we're still steadying the ship and kind of making sure we, 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 we swim the initial tide. So, no, we haven't got into that yet. Have you done stuff with Snapchat? Well, we've done a bit. I mean, mm. yeah, it depends on the editorial. I've seen a couple of bits um, that we've kind of partnered up and acquired from other parts of the BBC. It just depends on the editorial, you know, yeah. what the story is, basically. I mean, I'm not averse. I'm happy to try anything, but... Um, Fair enough. Yeah. And, uh, and, yeah, we, we recut stuff for Vertical. Um, we recut all, I, most of our op docs, and they go on just for Snapchat. Yeah, okay. So you're recutting other content, basically. Yeah, right we don't, we don't make it. It's not native Vertical. No. Okay, cool. Um... The lady at the front here, please. For Hi, um, this is a question for Nasrin. Um, I'm just really interested in the transition of BBC Three going online and how was that um, transition and um, the viewership now? I just was interested in that move. Um, sure. Um, well, I wasn't at the channel when it happened, but, I mean, it's gone well, I think, you know. Um, I mean, it's a different way of working and measuring success, so we wouldn't directly compare, like, you know, BBC Three Online versus BBC Three Television. For us, you know, we are consistently and continuously increasing our sort of, you know, target reach, if you like. We've won, a, you know, a range of, you know, kind of uh, prestigious awards. You know, we know that we're being talked about. We know that our audience care and that we care about our audience and our team's getting bigger and better and so we expanded to Birmingham. So for us, that's all success. So it's a range of ways of measuring. We don't sit there and have targets. We know we're a public service broadcaster. What we do know is that people like our stuff and everybody who works at BBC3 is very happy to work at BBC3. So it's all good. Um, other questions over there? There's a lady on the second row. I was just wondering, um, Naz, I know you mentioned Netflix um, have a partnership with someone, um, but are the likes of Amazon, Hulu, Netflix commissioning short-form content, or are you pitching to them? 
We, we wouldn't pitch where we publish. We, uh, we're a broadcaster. So um, I guess it's, uh, you know, if the content feels right. So, for instance, to take an example, we recently did some explainers about the royal wedding with Vox. And so that was kind of a partnership with them. Um, so where we would, my uh, remit is to commission content uh, for our platforms, essentially, that may, you know, as we did with Barcroft, we worked on a partnership whereby we commissioned content from them, but then they had a rights window thereafter. So um, I wouldn't, you know, it just depends, you know, we haven't had those conversations. So, uh, yeah. yeah so. Lindsay knows a bit about this because one of your ex-colleagues is over there doing it at Netflix, isn't he? So. Uh, yeah, my former colleague who actually started Off Docs, Jason Spingarnkoff, is now um, in, in feature documentaries, well, and short documentaries, I believe, at Netflix. So that, that's more the sort of 40-minute-ish sort, of, uh, sort of end of the scale. Okay, so they are looking for shorter content. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Yes, there's um, a gentleman at the back with glasses and then another um, gentleman behind. Yeah, as you just mentioned, um, rights windows. I just said to all the panel, actually. So traditionally, obviously, if it's AVOD... You imagine that once it's out, it's out. But are you finding that there's a model emerging where you can put it out for free and then take it down and then do something else with it and exploit the rights in a different way? I don't know enough about these things. You've got a bespoke uh, rights person, you can speak to him. But, I mean, look, there are various ways of working and certainly the ways that we work at BBC Changes. But we do have a... There's a wider digital kind of producer's kind of uh, guidelines and I would urge you and refer you to there if you like, but I don't know enough about it. Can I talk about that? Yeah, Sam's good. This is Sam's sort of... (laughs) So... This is where it does get boring again, so anyone's got a sleeping bag, roll it up. But um, I would say it's a brilliant point. I think the economy of digital originals is a really rich one. It's not quite um, worked itself out yet, but it is becoming better and better. So if you take a show and you make it with Snapchat in mind, and you can do a deal with Snapchat, then they have it for a window, and then... And this is... Bearing in mind you spend your own money to make the film, just to put that at the top, okay? If you spend your own money to make a film, so if I did one about my favourite cat, and um, basically Snapchat thought, that's a brilliant show, Sam's cat, let's do it. Ten eps, please. Um, As long as I've spent the money on it, basically I retain all the IP, right? So it's my choice where it goes, and it's my choice what rights I assign to it. And if people are interested in having that content on their platform, then they have to do a deal with me. So very different, and this is where I want to turn the TV curve upside down and say, if you make it yourself, it's up to you what you do with it. So it's a bit more of an indie filmmaker approach, maybe. So we will do deals with people where we have multiple income from the same content. And I've got shows where um, we start with an idea that then becomes might be a TV show, might give us a number of single documentaries from the same strand. It might give us... um, a uh, first window on a platform. It might then give us clip sales, and then we might even reversion it at the end back up into 30-minute episodes and sell it by a distributor. So one series, digital series, we might find five or six ways to make money out of it as long as we retain the IP at the top. Now, in that kind of golden days model where... Um, you go and see Naz, she says, oh, I love that idea about your cat, Sam, right? I'm going to pay you, but I'm going to keep it. Then that's a decision we take all the time. We go, do you know what? I'm so desperate to make this film about cats. I haven't eaten for a week. I'm in, right? And then we go and do it. So there's nothing wrong with that, and that's absolutely fine and a great way of doing things. But if you make it and you own it, then you can have a lot of different conversations. I think that's the future of a sustainable production model um, is doing... Uh, some of your work for other people and they own it and keep it and do what they like with it and then some of your work for yourself that you own and can exploit in a different way and I think if you can combine those two you get quite a robust business out of it as a freelance or as a company potentially and I would encourage people to think about trying to do both those things as a mix Um, yeah I hope that answers the question Um, lovely Um, the gentleman behind in the I think that's the back row there yeah Hey, um, I was wondering if uh, any of you on the panel have particular examples of really sort of mind-blowing work that use short form particularly well, perhaps that couldn't have been done previously. Um, well, should we work our way down? So. Uh, sure. Um, I was just talking with Naz about a film done by a filmmaker that's now working with her. Um, it was called 
uh, birth control, your own adventure, and it was a. I, if we'd had a chance to you know stream an excerpt, I would have probably streamed it because it was done by I want to say she was like 23, um, a, a young woman from Ohio uh, who had endometriosis and was really mad about it because. Um, she had a ton of side effects from the birth control that she'd been on for um, since she was 11 years old to con- uh, to deal with her endometriosis. And so that alone could be an interesting topic. It's been done a lot. Um, and I'm not sure that from that pitch on paper, I would have been like, oh, yeah, we need to have this. Um, however, the way that she did it was extraordinary. She, um, and I highly recommend watching it. It's like a five-minute film with an incredibly articulate and somehow also poetic and really funny rant um, about her experience experiences over the years done in kind of this like I don't know if you remember the um, the book, some of you, it sounds like it was nothing in England, but it was called Choose Your Own Adventure. Um, so the VO was very, very interesting and intriguing, and I still remember parts of it. But then the visuals were just, um, like, we couldn't pick a still for it uh, because it was just it, it was just so visually creative. And I'm kind of unlike a lot of things that we'd ever really seen before, using objects to somehow evoke her already really um, evocative language. And so um, that would be an example of kind of taking a topic and like a personal a personal story and like something that's bothering you and just really elevating it through really strong striking visual vocabulary and also literal vocabulary um, to um, to get your point across. Yeah, it's a tricky one because there's so much stuff out there. But um, for me personally, I think um, Childish Gambino's This Is America just mind blowing. I think smashed it this year. Probably the one piece of content I think a lot of people will remember. Yeah. This year, so. It's a good example, but it's not about functionality or anything, isn't it? It's just no. about something that's the right. Mm. Yeah, what do you mean? Well, it, it, I mean, it's only about functionality to the degree that it's a social thing. Yeah, um, see, yeah, but, but I mean, it's, 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 like nothing, it's, it's nothing. It's not got nothing to do with the technology that's now available. No, no, it's not. It's purely, but, but it's no, a, it's, about, it's, it's a kind point. of content that works fantastically well now. Yeah, but it's point in time as well. He's talking about yeah. things in time that couldn't have been told. You know, the question was five yeah. years ago. You know, yeah, yeah. it's a point in time. The, the timing, the execution, perfect, and mm. the person as well, mm. the talent. Mm. So. Fair um, nothing. Yeah, I can't think of anything that has struck me as mind-blowing with innovation but the, I suppose what what short form does and um, I recently saw something called the climate and the cross on uh, the Guardian and I think what it allows what what the space allows you to do really is maybe something that would feel stretched across a long form content those sort of miniature bite-sized things across a series kind of um, you, you know really, really lends itself to that form of storytelling so the climate and the cross is something that I would yeah. hi- highly recommend okay. which is which is about evangelists sort of uh, using, you know, talking, talking about ways they challenge um, climate change or disagree with it. And that's uh, episodic. It's, it's episodic, but yeah. the way they've played it across the platform is, 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 is in cha- is they've chapterised it. Mm. So it's... Um, it, it's in how many pieces? It's seven, seven, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I suppose, from my point of view, other than the technology or the kind of time constraints of it, I think it's about the fact that on these platforms... That's, you can just tell stories that really aren't likely to get commissioned by other people most of the time. So whatever that space is, whether it's something that's avant-garde comedy or, mm. you know, I think BBC Three, by the way, are doing a fantastic job and, and, and I think people are going to be talking about the genius of BBC Three in a couple of years' time and the brave moves taken by everybody there. And I just want to say big up to the creative work that they're doing and how that's coming uh, seriously not just the stuff that I made although that's not bad but I think um, I would say more than that for a long time there's been nowhere to take contentious stories we made a film about the Ku Klux Klan we couldn't get that sold in America for love nor money and actually being able to put that on YouTube as a 12 minute film and then come to Sheffield actually pitch it and then have it as a Channel 4 documentary was a kind of a really good way of you know going into a subject area that traditionally people just weren't that interested in or didn't want to see those uncomfortable truths but if you can go and prove it by going and making that film in the first place and then kind of you're not going to get someone to pay you to go do that until you've proved you can do it so it's a wonderful proving ground and a wonderful um, opinion changing device potentially I think yeah um, the last piece of content that I commissioned at Channel 4 was a series called Naked and Invisible about people that wanted to disappear. They're five-minute pieces, um, did 120 million views in 10 days, um, so it's very much plugged into an international audience. 
and I don't think it could sort of work in any other context. Like, there's not a long-form series in it. It's kind of a spectacle film meets a kind of stunt film. Um, and um, there's nowhere else you could really put that sort of content. It's, it's absolutely kind of right for five minutes. And so I think there's a lot of stuff like that, including, you know, Naz's example, where short form just is the right length. Can we have some more? Yes, lady here. I think, let me, let's get your um, microphone just so that people at the back can hear. Yeah. So go, go again, so, please. Um, yeah. Yes, question one. Do you think short form lends itself more or less to having a host slash talent? Um, is it necessary or is it less necessary in your experience? How have you found that? And the second is to do with the language barrier. You mentioned, um, uh, Sam, about English uh, and, and sort of tapping in more to the English language so that opens up more avenues but if you are after um, universal themes and just great content um, is there a language barrier are you open and looking uh, for things that are made uh, globally internationally but that aren't in English and are there any barriers to that that you found and how do you overcome it okay lovely who wants to have a go at that so, first of all, presenter-led stuff. Do you use presenters a lot in your...? Uh, we, we do not. Um, we have, in the opinion section, we have a new initiative called Opinion Video that's um, a little bit more off the news and kind of news-driven, and we're toying with that idea, but we don't have anyone like that right now. Uh, Updocs is do- documentaries, like short films that are kind of festival-oriented, uh, so uh, they wouldn't lend themselves to a host. Um, and so far as your second question is concerned, we love films in other languages. We, we subtitle them. Uh, we are planning a film, a film series of uh, films about Mexico by Mexican filmmakers. They're obviously all in Spanish. Um, our Spanish-speaking audience, both domestically and internationally, is really important to us. Uh, so we'll subtitle the, those in English as well, of course. But uh, that's, that's one example of us kind of making a specific effort to. But we, we published another... Uh, film about a, a Tamil guy from southern India, I believe, uh, who was in, I think, Singapore. It was called Searching for Wives by a Bhutanese woman who was a film student in Singapore. And um, and he was looking, he was using kind of a traditional service um, of matchmaking service using photos um, to find a wife uh, back from his his uh, native, I think, village back in India. And that was all in his local, I think it was in Tamil. So uh, that, and we really tried to just as, Sam was saying that you want to kind of put your audience in the film. We, try, we tried really hard to get that in front of uh, people in India that spoke his language to try to get it to take off there. Um, but at the same time, we did feel like it had a universal quality that you didn't need to speak his language to understand what he was going through. It was kind of a perfect microcosm of an international story. So you've got some very BBC Three distinctive hosts. Do they play yeah. a role in short form? I mean, one of the things that we do when, when we talk about short form is um, we leverage long form. So um, we have a lot of long form commissions that still play out on terrestrial television, BBC One and BBC Two. So for instance, we've got Stacey Docks back then. We had Reggie Docks. And so um, some of the in-house short form team, they um, recut and reform some of that content for um, digital platforms. So in that instance, yes, you have got a piece of talent like, say, mm-hmm. Stacey talking to the women captured by ISIS. Um, I've done a few sort of, you know, uh, original commissions with talent, but, it, you know, we like to reflect our audience like everyone else is saying. We want young people's strong stories from straight from the horse's mouth, if you like. Mm. So um, unless the talent's kind of well-established or, you know, you kind of know why they're there, it's very hard to introduce. And I've done a bit of it, and it's a bit hit and miss at times. Right, so you know. Minority sport. Have you guys worked with... Um Presenters, um, short form? I suppose, uh, with short form. I, you know, the branded content that we've done. We can't, we've we've made a series for British Airways, and I think what what they wanted us to do is look at different destinations that they travelled to. But we had to find influencers and thought makers. You know, think think people in, the, in those in those particular places. So, you know, that I suppose it's people that had so, social currency, and in that case, of course, it really worked for the brand. Um, and and, and I suppose it opens a it opens a pool of talent that is very on, you know, on TV as well, you know, you, people who are influencers online that, you know, will tend to be over, overlooked in, in some ways, you, you kind of, it opens, a, it opens a gambit for them. Okay. You know. 
Can I just ask you very briefly about um, branded content? Because we haven't talked much about that. Mm. Have you produced um, any branded content that you would kind of put up there with the rest of the stuff that you make for broadcasters and so forth, where the fact that it happens to be brand-funded um, has no impact on the quality? It's a great bit of content in its own right. Um, or is there usually some element yes, of compromise? Yes, we, 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 we did a series for Netflix. It was an online short campaign for the, the series they had called The Get Down. And so we, we did all their social content. And I, I felt that that could, you know, taken across, a, taken across something that was slightly longer, could, it, could have easily made a, a nice long-form yeah. piece or, or, you know, as, as strong a long-form piece as, as the short bits that it was serialised into. Yeah. So, um, you know, it was looking at the history of hip-hop and, and where that came from and, you know, y- y- using British urban artists and grime artists, as you saw, Big Nasty there, sort of where, if their influences came from hip-hop and that, you know, I think that could easily have been taken into a long-form space as well. But, again, as Sam said earlier, if you're being paid to do something, you shut up and get on with it. Um, I think we've only got time for two more questions. So I have that gentleman there in the black T-shirt and um, the the lady with the sunglasses at the back, second row from the back. This uh, short-form section, how does it affect the accumulated total number of uh, viewing? So does it steal from the long version documentaries? Or Sorry, does it steal from the... Uh, long version documentaries. Uh, for example, there is an average worldwide yeah. at the time people may consume uh, for screening certain uh, materials. So in this sense, uh, short stuff bring more and more expansion uh, yeah. to the market for screening and the number of viewing per day, for example, uh, in totality. And uh, so if it brings... Uh, then National Geography and all the ch- type of channels shouldn't do very much. But if the same cake has been shared, you know, by the uh, short protagonists, m- filmmakers, then uh, I think there should be tougher competition. So I, think, I think it's a new cake. It's a new, bigger cake. Um, okay. um, the, the lady at the back. Hi, I just had a question about viewer habits in terms of um, short-form series. Do you think that uh, the audience will come back for serialised content or do you think that closed episodes work better in this world? Um, Is this for for factual? Yeah. yeah. Has anyone um, got any thoughts on that? So um, a really successful short-form commission um, of ours was um, Eating With My Ex and their closed eps. Uh, so successful that it's now turning into a long form series um, but for us it, that felt right I mean when you look at digital when you look at digital content you know some of those or vast majority of those kind of formatted um, uh, factual pieces are closed apps and so they're titled and they're labelled and they're thumbnailed and they're positioned in that way for you to click on one and then you're going to click on the rest so um, I mean you know there are examples of kind of uh, serialised and I think we're sort of yet we, you know to go down that road and I'd like to try you know, stuff that completely sort of breaks the kind of mould um, but I mean at the moment we're so focused on you know, each individual commission we're looking at how do you best position it so that we get people to series full stop if you like you know. um, Just to jump in yeah, there yeah. I think absolutely that's kind of got to be the next step really I think um, the economy is still a challenged one for most people and therefore you really need to build brands like in a commercial point of view from a commercial point of view we've as I said earlier launched 13 series on watch and what's interesting about the way that Facebook have set up watch is it's by shows not by channels and I think the data inside broadcasters that I am privy to says that people care about shows more than channels um, consumers and so I think it's really important that all of us and it's brilliant for young producers or old producer or whoever because you, can, you don't need a channel, right? You just need a show. So if you can build a series brand, you can absolutely smash it off the back of the brand. I didn't know who commis- which um, 
network commission Breaking Bad, but I bloody love Breaking Bad, you know, and I didn't really care either. And I think um, Bake Off has shown that in the UK to great, you know, I hated it when um, Channel 4 bought Bake Off. I was in a huff, uh, you know, <laughs> for days, because I was just like, why are you spending 75 million quid on something that you can already get on BBC One when, you know, but they were right. You know, they were right. They proved that people didn't care whether it was on BBC One or Channel 4. They just wanted to watch the show they loved. So I really believe that absolutely our strategy is build series brands on short form and take them when they're successful as Naz's show is and then take them to long form if you possibly can because that's when you'll start getting the earn back um, for all the hard work you've put in earlier on. Can you just give us an idea, a couple of examples of series that you've developed in that way? You know, yeah, we, titles. yeah, we developed um, Amazing on the Inside for Netflix that way. Um, what else have we done in series? Well, we're working with a lot of distributors now to where we don't have a commissioner, where we yeah. commission it internally. So uh, we've got a show called Extreme Love, which has mm. um, just been announced that we've done a deal on. That does very well for us. We've got another show called... Um, uh, Ridiculous Rides, which is a car show that's um, now gone out as a TV show. Um, we did Hooked on the Look, that's just sold to Channel 7 in Australia, which didn't have a TV commissioner. We've done six series this year, long-form series that haven't had a commissioner commission them, and we've just developed a, an internal economy that means the little bits of money we get via our short form um, add up to enough for us to uh, re-up those short form, mid-form episodes into half hours or hour long series, and then we sell them. Lovely. Um, so I hope um, that you will have got a sense um, both of the kind of the way that um, short forms evolving very fast, that there are business models that are starting to catch up with it so that people are um, running viable and international and successful businesses um, with short form at the heart. And also I think there's been a strong sense from the um, panellists that there's a lot of opportunity here. So I'm afraid um, the light is flashing. We have to pack it up now. But if you could just um, show your appreciation for this uh, panel.